Hello everyone, my name is Uswa Saragina, uh, and this is my talk titled Living or LARPing Consuming Culture on the Commodification of LARP. Uh, so uh, just to give you a little background about myself, I am a longtime LARPer and also a consumer sociologist uh, by my profession. So I research consumption as a cultural entity. And so I'm combining these two uh, major things in my life uh, in this presentation. Before we dive into the commodification of LARP on its own, uh, I want to talk about the terminology that I'm using. Uh, so what, what do I mean by consumption? What do I mean by commodity and by consumer culture? So in a very um, stereotypical way, we tend to understand consumption as almost a transaction. So it's something to something that's being bought, um, something that we're acquiring. Uh, but consumption is a lot more than that. Um, at its core, really, it's a type of relationship or a power dynamic. Uh, so consumption is mainly about appropriating something. Consumption is the process of a consumer specifically appropriating a commodity for their own personal needs and to satisfy their desires. So uh, it's, it's a very skewed type of power relationship that's focused on personal needs and also about having and appropriating something rather than engaging with it communally um, or, or sort of... Um, in a, in a together sort of fashion. So, so consumption then can become a cultural way of approaching any type of relationship. And that's what we see in society today when we talk about consumer culture. Uh, what is usually meant by this is that consumption becomes uh, not only kind of the driver of our economies, but also the way we interact with the world. So we take this notion of being able to have anything that we want um, into not only the store and the marketplace, but also into our communities, into our personal relationships, into all of our hobbies, activities, etc. And this significantly skews, obviously, how, how society is structured. Uh, things tend to become more focused on objectification, on gratification, instant gratification of personal needs. There's less focus on communality, um, on the other uh, as a source of needs and desires as well. Um, and and so, it, so it skews power dynamics in general. So in this setup, a commodity is then whatever object that is being consumed and becomes the focus of consumer culture. And this is how I want to talk about LARP today, as becoming uh, a part of this very different type of power dynamic and a different kind of relationship to things. So how is LARP becoming a commodity? So uh, just to make a note, this isn't really based on an empirical piece of research. This is more uh, based on a cultural assessment that I've made, um, having engaged in LARP myself for a long time. Uh, and obviously also informed by my background as a consumer culture researcher. And I want to make a note as well that this is not meant to call out any LARP designers or LARP organizers. Uh, I think a lot of the things that have led to commodification have actually been done uh, with a wish to develop the community in a good manner. Uh, but I think we also need to reflect on how that impacts our relationship to each other, our relationship to LARP, and our formation as a community. So, uh, so what are the central things I think that have led to commodification of LARP? So firstly, wider acknowledgement of LARP. Um, and what, what I mean by this is that LARP has become known in wider society as an activity, as um, and, and what is actually done within LARP, what it is, um, you know, what kind of themes uh, LARP engages in. This has come through a lot of media coverage uh, that we've seen um, in the past years, which has led to also new collaborations, opportunities. Uh, so, you know, LARPers work with journalists, with companies, etc. 
we've also, you know, engaged in helping out to create different types of experiences based on LARP, right? What this has led to uh, is that there's easier access to LARP now, which is, which is a really good thing, right? Uh, LARP is no longer kind of a hidden marginalized activity, so people can find it a lot easier. Um, it's easier for new people to come in um, to understand how, how they can become a part of this community. And so LARP as, a, uh, as, a, as an activity is becoming more and more integrated into wider society. So on the one hand, this is really good because we can get more support, we can get more engagement. Um, on the other hand, because the wider society, at least in the Western world, is very much a consumer culture. So we base most of our interactions on consumption. We uh, expect to be consumers um, on an unacknowledged level in almost any context. And so we also start bringing this into LARP. Uh, again, in a very subconscious level, because uh, it starts being seen as a more wide cultural process, we also then bring in that wider culture into LARP. Uh, secondly, uh, and linked to the previous point, uh, there's a growing demand for LARP. Uh, we've, as we've gained more visibility in wider culture, you know, we've gained more and more people that engage in LARP, so our community has grown a lot. So uh, we see more and more LARPs where there's a lot more people that want to attend uh, than there are spots open. So there, there is kind of more and more demand for LARPing. There's more and more demand uh, for different kinds of LARP uh, handling different themes. Uh, and so, so we almost see like there's more, uh, there's more customers than, uh, than we can uh, provide services to if we want to take on this language. What this has led to, I believe, is that there's more and more professionalization of our practices, which is, again, a, a good thing. Right? We see more standardization of how LARP is designed. This, is, this makes it easier for LARP designers and LARP organizers because there's kind of an existing network, an existing um, structure to build off. There's kind of existing rules. Uh, there's more standardization of how we treat um, emotions as part of LARP, things like bleed. Uh, we tend to have, you know, a lot more safety in LARPs, both uh, physical and mental. Uh, and so we have developed in a really good direction through this kind of professionalization and standardization. Um, on the other hand, while there's a lot of good things to this, um, this has led to a number of, um, of more negative repercussions. Uh, because we see more and more professionalization of practices, uh, there is an expectation almost of customer service. And I think a lot of LARP organizers will definitely agree with me on this is even though a LARP event is not a for-profit event and it's not made by people who are being paid for this as a job most of the time, the people attending do tend to, a lot of the time, approach as if they've paid for a service. Uh, and this obviously grows with uh, the more expensive a LARP is, the more uh, it uh, requires economic investment, uh, the more we start seeing it as a service. Uh, you know, you do tend to see this language, oh, I didn't get my money's worth, uh, didn't get the experience that I wanted. Even though, uh, as a basis, you know, LARP doesn't have uh, a kind of a predetermined experience that we usually have. And I think in the past, we used to be fine with this. This growing uh, expectation of customer service is also linked to just the visuals of LARPs. You know, we tend to see a lot more professional um, kind of propping of LARPs, you know, lighting, uh, just technical skills, which is all really excellent. But I think it becomes then difficult for us as individuals to make the difference between a professional theater uh, event, for example, and a LARP event, while these are, these are very different things. And I'm sure on a conscious level, we all understand the difference. But on a subconscious level, not necessarily, right? And this is where the issue comes in, is that 
there's this underlying level of behavior that then comes in uh, and changes our attitudes in some ways. And so linked to this expectation of customer service, our roles change, right? So the organizers become like producers, like service providers, and the participants become uh, customers. And that significantly changes the power dynamic, the relationship that a participant and an organizer has. It doesn't become a communal experience and a communally created experience, but it rather becomes something that organizers uh, provide to the participants. And I think this significantly shifts the way that, that LARP has been approached by people. Uh, as we go further into this attitude, we will obviously be giving it to the new generations, right? So when new LARPers come in, they will be acculturated uh, into, into this different type of attitude, and then it will be more difficult um, to go back to more kind of communal creation of events. A third point in terms of commodification uh, is the objectification of LARP. So I think LARP as um, just as an activity is becoming more and more objectified, which is again very much linked to, uh, to just consumer culture, to commodification, because a commodity in its nature is objectified. A commodity cannot be a subject, um, it cannot be a communally created um, uh, kind of ideal, but it's rather an object that we appropriate. And so if we objectify LARP, we commodify it. Um, so so how, does this, how does this emerge? Um, and these are kind of the ways I've noticed it. So firstly, I think the language around, around LARP is becoming more and more objectified. So if you think about things like uh, instead of signing up to a LARP, we talk about buying a ticket. So this already, this type of language, even though it seems silly and quite minute, um, it significantly changes our attitude towards things, right? We're not signing up to an event, but we're purchasing our right to be there. Um, and that's, that's a very, very different type of thing, right? There's also, and, and there's, other, there's other language like that, right? Um, there's also a lot of quote-unquote fan products uh, within LARP these days. Um, so, you know, we see kind of shirts, stickers, etc., and these are all, I'm not saying we shouldn't do this. Of course, these are very important tools to get uh, monetary support. These are good ways to promote events. But at the same time, we are copying a lot of the structures that commercial event organizing does. And so again, we're taking on this existing culture of consumer culture and bringing it back to LARP. And a third major way that I'm seeing objectification of LARP take place is through documentation. And again, I think this is a very tricky subject. So by documentation, I mean things like photographing LARPs and uh, videotaping LARPs. These are all really good ways of, um, of kind of giving mementos to participants and also for organizers to have you know, artistic documentation of what they've created. However, the level of this, again, is rising more and more into professionalism, as a lot of LARP photographers will attest to. And again, there's an expectation of professionalism, even though these people are almost never paid, or even, you know, even their costs are not covered. Um, at the same time, while we expect this very high level of documentation, these events that are in them in their nature ephemeral what i mean so they're not capturable right a larp performance is is something that we live together something that is not a solid kind of object right it should be communally lived communally created we are essentially uh, freezing it in time by documenting it and all of a sudden other people can consume it, right? So not only those people who were present at the LARP, but other people can essentially live through it by watching a video or, um, you know, or looking at photographs. And 
while I agree this is great for accessibility and for showing LARPs, we also need to think about what this does to our understanding of what LARP is. Can we really freeze it in time and space? Um, and lastly, uh, and maybe most importantly, I think commodification is being driven by this wish to be recognized and legitimized by wider society. And I've already touched upon this a lot, right? So I think a lot of what is driving our need and want um, is, is to be recognized, right? And this is, a very, um, this is a very basic human need to be understood by others, to be legitimized as something good and something necessary. And so I don't think there's anything bad in this drive. But we also need to think about why we want to be recognized and by whom do we want to be recognized and legitimized. Because this is clearly affecting how we organize LARP, how we market LARP, right? We're turning more and more to um, kind of commercial structures of organization, commercial structures of marketing. Uh, there's a strong focus on sort of careerization of LARP. So people want to make a career out of LARP. But we need to think about how power structures will change, how people's relationships will change once um, some people are making money off of something. If creating a LARP becomes a job, uh, will it be that same community anymore? And I don't know. Um, these are kind of questions I want to be asking you rather than claiming anything. So what are the repercussions of commodification? There's obviously both uh, good and bad things to it. Um, and I think n none of these are just one sided. They all come with good and bad things. Um, and, but I would I would like to go through these next. So first of all, there's more accessibility of LARP. I mentioned this already. So with commodification, uh, we allow LARP to be more widely accessible in the sense that more people know about it, uh, but it's also easier to gain access to events. Um, it's easier to attend events, even if you've never been to a LARP before, because they're mediatized much better, advertised much better. There's also more acknowledgement of different accessibility needs. Uh, and so uh, LARPs become uh, much more accessible to a variety uh, of marginalized groups. At the same time, uh, there is this growing class of differences in LARP, and we especially see this with kind of more high production value LARPs, um, which again, I don't, high production does not equal commodification, but these are definitely the extreme example of commodification, right? And the more we have to pay for a LARP, or not have to, but the more we do pay for LARP, the less accessible LARP becomes to um, a wide variety of people. So on an economic way, uh, it becomes difficult for, or it becomes less accessible for everyone to LARP. At the same time, um, there's a growing kind of difference between other marginalized groups so when LARP becomes a commodity, it becomes a very specific type of commodity, right? Because consumer culture in general is geared at a very specific type of consumer, right? We're all free to be consumers, but only if we're right kinds of consumers. And so what I'm weary of is that LARP is also taking on um, this attitude and starting to leave out a lot of kind of marginalized groups. For example, we don't see um, that much ethnic diversity within LARPing, right? We don't see that much class-based diversity in LARPing. Um, why is that? Uh, why do these people not want to attend? Are we not, you know, are we not giving them enough opportunities? Um, are we, or do we not seem like an activity that would welcome them? So something, something to think about. Uh, there's also growing prof professionalization of LARP. Uh, I talked about this earlier. So in addition to kind of uh, people building, you know, trying to build careers out of LARP, there's also a growing tendency of any aspect of LARP to be professionally made. 
you know, be it propping, be it lighting, uh, catering. And while it's great that we are raising the standards of our activity, what I'm wary of is that we might also be uh, making it difficult for, for LARPers in the future to learn skills. Because I think one great thing about LARP has been is that, is that it's allowed people from different backgrounds um, to do different tasks, to do different types of labor. Uh, and um, w without any need of kind of training. Um, and we're essentially cutting that off from a lot of people. Uh, there's also a growing trend to kind of have almost professional skills when you are LARPing something. Um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, and again, we, we might be cutting off uh, people from learning very important skills by not allowing them to try them out as part of LARP. At the same time, we bring in this standardization and repeatability through professionalization. Uh, these again can be good things, as I mentioned, uh, you know, it can bring a lot more norms, a lot more uh, safety techniques, um, things like that. So there's, uh, there's plenty of good about standardization. But at the same time, we might be creating uh, experiences that are very repeatable. And again, this is a central aspect of a commodity is that it can be reproduced on a large scale. Uh, but is that something we want? Do we want to have a repeatable, um, a repeatable commodity that we're providing through LARP? What this is often driven by is continued growth, right? So we uh, we see a growth in the size of LARPs, in how much they cost, what their budgets are, uh, what their ambition is. And this is great, you know, if, if that's what we want to be doing, uh, we're definitely nailing it. Uh, but we want to also question why we want that growth. What, what is the purpose of it? Consumer culture in general is based on the idea of growth, of never-ending growth. And this is something that we've gotten through kind of a capitalist uh, society. Never-ending development, uh, never-ending growth. But what, what do we need that growth for? Um, if we can answer that question, well, then sure, let's do it. But if we don't have an answer, um, then I think we need to rethink whether we need this growth in our lives. Uh, and this, with this growth, there's also a changed scale of production, right? So we're no longer talking about communal events where everyone pitches in, but we need to have professional production teams because otherwise we just can't create create these events right you know if it's a LARP for several hundred people all of a sudden it doesn't work that it's someone's friend who's going to cook for the group right it has to be professionalized and so in the sense with this need and desire to grow we are forcing um, LARP to become professionalized and thus commodified so again rethinking whether we want this. Uh, and again, in connection to this, we need to rethink about labor in LARP. You know, if things become more and more professionalized, um, people will start expect to be paid. It becomes more like a job rather than a communal uh, event, um, you know, something that you volunteer for. Uh, and again, that can create difficulties with power, difficulties with economic resources, um, potentially exploitation of labor. Um, so again, it's like, it's like a set of dominoes. Everything just keeps falling, falling down. And what this can result to is skewed power relations. Uh, you know, how much power will the producer have if we take on a commodification perspective? Because in this case, the consumer has the power to decide, right? Uh, will um, different crew members uh, have to, you know, all of a sudden be in a hierarchical structure of a labor force? Uh, you know, will, will we end up in being in this customer-producer type of relationship when attending LARPs? So thinking about how our relationships to one another will change if 
we continue in this direction of commodification. Uh, so essentially, if we think about LARP as a commodity, it allows us to tap into our freedom as consumers. So in a consumer culture setting, um, we essentially gain agency and freedom through the act of consumption and through taking on the role of consumers, uh, which seemingly allows us choice making, um, you know, in a way that traditional communities wouldn't allow us. Uh, but this, of course, brings with it a lot of difficulties. But so how does LARP allow us this consumer freedom? So obviously we get this personification of experience. We tend to see a lot more people going into LARPs with this very specific wish, right, uh, of, of gaining an experience, a specific type of experience, which is obviously fine. Um, but then that doesn't necessarily work with this lived nature of LARP and this, this kind of improvised nature of LARPing. Uh, what also uh, emerges is LARP becomes almost a scarce commodity. Uh, and this is very much linked to uh, consumer culture, which is often driven by this scarcity because scarcity brings desire. And so a lot of the time commodities are made to seem as if they're scarce in order for there to be more desire for them. And what I fear is that we're doing the same thing uh, when we kind of pump up these different events, um, you know, uh, also with this kind of um, skewed numbers of, of kind of participant slots um, versus people who want to attend. Um, and so potentially this professionalization is also leading uh, to seeming scarcity. Um, also in many ways our desire for LARP, this consumption-based desire becomes a driving force for the growth that we're experiencing. Uh, desire, again, is a central driving force of consumer culture, and I think we are seeing it emerge um, in LARP community, and that's what really kicks in this need to professionalize and need to grow. However, what also comes in is when we focus on the self and on this scarcity on our growth, we end up in a situation where there's no obligation to others. There's no obligation to others' needs. And we focus more and more on ourselves, which I think is a pity for a community which I've found to be um, extremely community-based um, in, in a way that's very different from a lot of other communities. We also could be losing a lot of our creativity, our interactivity, and these emergent characteristics of LARP, which have always been these kind of central values and kind of core characteristics of LARP. Um, and what I'm afraid of is that with this commodification, we will be losing a lot of these uh, because of this focus on growth, on standardization, um, and on personal needs. So how do we go forward as a community? I don't have any concrete answers. I'm probably going to leave you with more questions. Um, but some thoughts that I have had. I think acknowledgement of the situation is the first step towards reflection. By understanding uh, what commodification is, um, and it, again, it's a very subconscious thing. It's a very unreflected thing that we're doing. But I think if we start acknowledging it, we can begin thinking whether we want this, whether we want to do something else. We need to be asking ourselves why we want to grow and develop in certain ways. Is it just because it's legitimized by the wider society uh, and, and we just want to follow along? Or, or do we actually want something concrete out of this? Will it help us develop as a community? Uh, will it help us develop as an activity? Obviously, we need to think about practicalities. We do live in a world that's very consumer culture driven. Um, does that mean that we need to succumb to this? I don't know. Uh, maybe. Uh, I, I hope not. Uh, but also, we need to think about at what cost do we engage? Do we, do we succumb to this culture entirely? Um, or do we bring something uh, of our own to question these wider consumer culture structures? I think we should tap into our roots as a marginalized activity. LARP has previously lived on the outskirts 
of consumer culture, because we've been such kind of a different marginalized uh, hobby. Uh, and in that way, we've developed very different forms of interaction, of community creation, of event organization. And I think we could learn by going back to our roots and thinking about how we did things differently and why that worked in certain ways. And maybe that's, that is a good way of questioning consumer culture. So in that way, maybe we can use LARP to understand LARP as well. You know, we use LARP to understand a lot of different issues in society, a lot of identity-related issues, community-related issues, politics-related issues. So maybe we can use our own activity um, to understand ourselves better, so almost like meta-LARPing. All in all, I think we need to be continuing to ask ourselves questions and questioning our own development and whether in the long run, these are good tactics that we're taking on. Uh, this is it for me. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I'm happy to uh, continue this discussion online uh, and so hopefully chat to you soon. Thank you.